Bloom, Buddhist Reflections on Serenity and Love by Ajahn Sona. Chapter 7, Jhana Bodies I have a surprise subject tonight. I think I'll talk about breath meditation. Breath meditation runs right into discussion about jhana. You really can't understand it separately from other teachings and descriptions that the Buddha gives about jhana. Because Anapanasati is only four tetrads, four four-line structures, almost like a sonnet structure, it's very brief. It's brief so that people, monks and of course lay people, can remember it easily. Lay people took these meditation subjects up as well as monks at the time of the Buddha. They practiced them and they attained high levels of mindfulness. They attained levels of jhana as well, and they also attained levels of enlightenment. So if you're ever wondering whether lay people can do these things, certainly at the time of the Buddha, both lay people and monastics attained to these things. And there's nothing to say that such things cannot happen in these days. When you read books, though, on Anapanasati, some will emphasize it as mindfulness practice and vipassana practice. They will somehow skip over the fact that the second tetrad, also the third tetrad, has to do with jhana. It's very explicit in the suttas as well as in the Anapanasati. The four tetrads are a section of the sutta, and the Buddha goes on to add the four foundations of mindfulness. He explains, as I did a few nights ago, that breath meditation fulfills the four foundations of mindfulness. Then he also goes on to explain that the four foundations of mindfulness fulfill the seven factors of awakening, or the seven factors of enlightenment. He shows the relationship, so you can see in the structure of this development of breath meditation how it is also referring to the four foundations of mindfulness. Mindfulness of breath is one of the foundations. It's mindfulness of the body, the first foundation. Then there is mindfulness of feelings, mindfulness of the mind, and mindfulness of Dhamma categories. The Dhamma categories contain a beautiful overlap. The fourth foundation of mindfulness, mindfulness of Dhamma categories, contains the seven factors of enlightenment. So he's tying all this together. I didn't just make that up. It's part of the arrangement of some of the presentations of Anapanasati in the suttas. This is why we can know quite well what is intended in the Anapanasati without going to commentaries and without just guessing. Because the language in the mindfulness of breathing is very brief and very terse, people speculate. Even the commentaries speculated about it. For instance, one of the things they talked about was in the first tetrad. There is a debate over sabakaya. Is sabakaya literally meaning the whole breath or the whole body? Kaya is body and saba is all or whole, complete. To begin an explanation of this debate, in the next tetrad we have a couple of words that refer to joy. We have the word piti and we have this calming tranquility, a form of pasada. Those should ring bells because those are two of the enlightenment factors and they go in that order as well. Piti with pasadi or pasada, tranquility, following. Then, following that, concentration, samadhi. So we definitely know that these are referred to in a certain order. But when you're doing breath meditation, what about your body? How much attention should you pay to the body? How much should you just stay with the breath as it contacts the nose? Or where I prefer, inside the nose, the nasal cavity. By the way, you have a much better chance of feeling it there. There are lots of people who cannot feel the rims of their nostrils and they can't feel the tip of their nose. Totally insensitive. What are they going to do? Not do breath meditation? No. Wherever you can feel it, use that. The only thing is not to move your mind around. The function of this is that you're settling on a very subtle, gentle object, and it's stilling the mind and allowing the mind to focus. Remember, you're already quite good at moving your mind around. It just does that by itself. That's not what we need here. 
So first, we've eliminated that. What's left? The mind becoming still. Now, I could give a rough approximation from memory, but I thought I would read out the words of the Buddha on the nature of the relationship to your whole body and to PT and the positive experiences of tranquility and PT, of blissful experience. Notice that in the first tetrad, this is sometimes translated as one breathes in, experiencing the whole body. One breathes out, experiencing the whole body. As mentioned, quite often this is taught as the whole physical body. But I tend to want to keep it as the whole body of the breath, not the physical body. Breathing in, I experience the entire duration of the breath. Breathing out, I experience the entire duration of the breath. Why do I prefer that to experiencing the whole flesh body? Breathing in, I experience my whole flesh body. Breathing out, I experience my whole flesh body. Because I think it's premature. We're going to experience the whole body, but we're going to experience bliss throughout the whole body. And that is in the next tetrad. Let me explain even that, because it's not explicitly referred to. Breathing in and out, I experience PT. Breathing in and out, I experience tranquilization, tranquility. We have to figure out what he's saying there. Should you just stay with your mind experience of PT and tranquility, or is it something larger? Here's how we solve questions like that. We find another sutta that fills in more detail. I don't normally read, I just wing it, but tonight I've brought a book. This book is interesting. It's handwritten in pencil, printed in pencil by me. This is the way we had to do it before computers. You get your favorite beautiful passage, and you take your best printing, which in my case is not very good, and your best pencil, if you're lucky enough to have one. And you print it out for future reference into a book given to you by somebody. This here is a very nice book given to me by somebody. So then I got my pencil. These are some direct words of the Buddha on the jhanas. From the Maha Asapura Sutta, Middle Length Discourses number 39, on the four jhanas. Quote, Having abandoned these five hindrances, imperfections of the mind that weaken wisdom, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, Secluded from unwholesome states, he enters upon and abides in the first jhana, which is accompanied by applied and sustained attention, with rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. End quote. Rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. First of all, they recommend that you go to a quiet place. That's kaya viveka, seclusion of the body. But the seclusion they are really talking about is seclusion of the mind, citta viveka. It's secluded from interaction with the exterior sensory world. This is true seclusion. If you truly want to get away from things, you can't just do that with your body. As you can see, your mind follows you. You go, you're alone someplace, there's nobody around, and yet the place is full because your mind is full. So seclusion is brought up here, rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. That means you're not surrounded by the other agents of your normal mind. You're secluded away from them through this process of applied and sustained attention. Quote, Then in a very deliberate way, he makes the rapture and pleasure. End quote. No shame in rapture and pleasure. Quote, He makes the rapture and pleasure born of seclusion, drench, steep, fill and pervade this body so that there is no part of his whole body unpervaded by the rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. Just as a skilled bathman or a bathman's apprentice heaps bath powder in a metal basin and sprinkling it gradually with water kneads it until the moisture wets the ball of bath powder, soaks it, and pervades it inside and out. Yet the ball itself does not ooze. So too, a bhikkhu makes the rapture and pleasure born of seclusion 
drench, steep, fill, and pervade this body, so that there is no part of this whole body unpervaded by the rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. End quote. There is enough repetition here that there's no mistaking what he's saying. We're talking about the entire body, every aspect of it. He uses a physical thing in the analogy to give you the idea. It's a physical thing, and you're working. There's activity. You're working it into and making it pervade. Don't allow it to just be in your mind, a little bit of joy. Don't allow it to just exist in your heart. This has got to fill, pervade. He likes to repeat, using several words to emphasize how extremely it pervades the entire body. It drenches, it steeps, it fills, it pervades. There are some interesting things to reflect on. Notice that the bathman does it with skill, and yet the ball does not ooze. It doesn't actually go beyond your body. You don't ooze joy. Thank goodness. Although that is a phrase you find in literature. So-and-so came in oozing joy. Well, in this case, it's not for anybody else. It's just for you. You're not oozing it out of you. You are contained. It stays within you and pervades the entire body. So if you read instructions on breath meditation where there's an emphasis on getting the breath or the sense of the breath to go throughout the entire body, I don't think it's important. What's important is to get bliss to go throughout your entire body. Not the breath, the bliss. We're not leaving the entire body out of this. Piti sukha is what you're going to get in the first jhana. All of your mind, your emotional condition, and your whole body is brought into this. The similes are extremely important. Notice it's a bathman or his apprentice. Why his apprentice? Isn't it enough to have a bath man, a soap guy? Why bring in this apprentice person? Because it's for a person who's a master of this or for one who's learning it. It's not just for masters to pervade their entire body with piti sukha. One who is learning this also pervades their entire body. Whenever you hear so-and-so or his apprentice, the Buddha means whether you're advanced or you're just learning. Both types of people do the same thing. If this were not so, he would distinguish. He would say, the master does this, but the apprentice does that. In this case, both do the same thing. Whether you're a beginner or advanced, you both have the same duty to bring this up fully, completely pervading the entire body. Notice it's active. It's not just that he holds the bowl under a fountain and it fills up. No, he squeezes it through his entire body. You're actually using your will, your imagination. You're smiling it into existence. You're using whatever resources you possibly can. While you're sitting still watching your breath, what resources can you bring to this? Each breath, while you're maintaining awareness of the breath, You're trying to also become aware of the emotional quality of the experience. And you're bringing that quality up in some ways. This joy, you're creating this. You're celebrating your seclusion, your peace. It's joyful. You're free for a while. You've freed yourself from the hindrances. There is nothing harassing you anymore. There's no future. There's no past. There's no problems. You're free. What a blissful experience that is. That takes a lot of faith and confidence because something about ordinary life tells us that we're not allowed to do that. We have real problems and we're not allowed to ever stop having them. Except that it's all in your head. There are real problems out there, but they are only problems when you think about it. You don't always have problems. Sometimes you're doing something else and you forget to have a problem. So that means it's in your head. The experience is in your head. Quote, Again, bhikkhus, with the stilling of applied and sustained thought, end quote. Now this is talking about the next jhana. If you get to the first jhana, it's not just get to the first jhana. It's a supernormal attainment. It's very, very wondrous and profound. 
something to be treasured and carefully kept and practiced. But I'm just going to read out the next jhanas because it's so inspiring and also has to do with the entire body. Quote, Again, bhikkhus, with the stilling of applied and sustained thought or attention, which has self-confidence and singleness of mind without applied and sustained thought, with rapture and pleasure born of concentration, end quote. What's being said is that before this point, your mind wanders a bit from the breath, and then you lift it back to the breath. This is in the first jhana. Sometimes it slips off. So in the first jhana, even still applying your mind, it's drifting. You're applying, it's drifting. Sometimes it's sustaining. It's sustaining. And now it's still. It's set. Now you can take your hands away. End of applied and sustained thought. Second jhana. It's fixed. Ekagata. Singularity of mind or wholeheartedness is fully established. And still, there is joy and pleasure. Quote, He makes the rapture and pleasure born of concentration, drench, steep, fill, and pervade this body. So there is no part of his whole body unpervaded by the rapture and pleasure born of concentration. Just as though there were a lake whose waters welled up from below and it had no inflow from the east, west, north, or south, and would not be replenished from time to time by showers of rain, then the cool fountain of water welling up in the lake would make the cool water drench, steep, fill, and pervade the lake, so that there would be no part of the whole lake unpervaded by cool water. So, too, a bhikkhu makes the rapture and pleasure born of concentration, drench, steep, fill, and pervade this body, so that there is no part of this whole body unpervaded by the rapture and pleasure born of concentration, end quote. Here in this image, you have a change from active working. There's no external input. It's not fed by the rain. It's not fed by streams. It's fed internally. A fountain, a well within you is bubbling up and pervading. Also, it's very cool, so there's a slight change. There's a mention of temperature change, a sweeping through the entire system. But there's nobody doing this now. It's kind of naturally rising. So this is not a human working, not stirring it in or something like that. Now it's just welling up. There are still the same qualities, pleasure and bliss, but without effort. It's effortlessly pervading, swelling through the body. This is the second jhana. So let there be no doubt that this includes your whole body. Quote, Again, bhikkhus, with the fading away as well of rapture, a bhikkhu abides in equanimity, and mindful and fully aware, still feeling pleasure with the body. End quote. Now the piti, The joy of the mind is subsiding. You're going into something. We get a little hint from the mention of temperature change, of cooling. The piti is moving towards something called upeka, or equanimity, which is extremely pleasant, not just neutral, but different than joy. Quote, still feeling pleasure with the body, end quote. So the body is still experiencing this extreme well-being. Quote, he enters upon and abides in the third jhana, on account of which noble ones announce he has a pleasant abiding who has equanimity and is mindful. End quote. An abiding is a place that you dwell, a place where you live. You have a place to go that is extraordinarily pleasant. It's a divine place. It's a very nice cabin by the lake, a nice piece of property. You have to have a lot of dough to own one of those, and this is the case with this jhana. In order to enter this, you have to pay. What is the payment? You have to establish yourself in virtue. You have to practice, but then it's retirement with a small pension. You don't have to work anymore. You just go there and dwell in bliss. 
quote, He makes the pleasure, divested of rapture, drench, steep, fill, and pervade this body, so that there is no part of his whole body not pervaded by the pleasure divested of rapture. Just as in a pond of blue or red or white lotuses, some lotuses that are born and grow in the water thrive immersed in the water without rising out of it, and cool water drenches, steeps, fills, pervades them to their tips and their roots, so that there is no part of all these lotuses not pervaded by cool water. So too a bhikkhu makes the pleasure divested of rapture drench, steep, fill, and pervade this body, so that there is no part of his whole body not pervaded by the pleasure divested of rapture. End quote. Again, you have a simile. You have to be the lotus, hanging, suspended in the water. No activity whatsoever. Remember at the beginning we had the kneading process, the manipulation to move pitisukha throughout your body in the first jhana. In second jhana, it starts to well up. It's a spring, but there's still motion in it. But in this simile for the third jhana, there is no motion. It's cool, and the lotuses are just hanging there. They're completely sustained by it, and there's a stillness, a deep quality of stillness. So you take all these similes, just like a poem, and you keep going over them in your mind until they speak to you, telling you you have to be the lotus hanging there. And you're not above the water. You're completely submerged in the water. The lotus still hasn't broken the surface. Now the last, the fourth jhana. Quote, Again, bhikkhus, with the abandoning of pleasure and pain and with the previous disappearance of joy and grief, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the fourth jhana, which has neither pain nor pleasure, end quote. So the pleasure aspect of the body is now gone. It's just neutral, neither pleasant nor painful. The body is hardly there. Quote, and purity of mindfulness due to equanimity, end quote. Joy has already left. The pleasure, the saturated pleasure of the body, has diminished as well. Quote, he sits pervading this body with a pure, bright mind, end quote. It's just pure mind that pervades the body at this point. Mind is the essence here. Now you're really having a purely cerebral experience. Quote, so that there is no part of his whole body not pervaded by the pure, bright mind. Just as though a man were sitting covered from the head down with a white cloth, so that there would be no part of his whole body not pervaded by the white cloth, so too a bhikkhu sits pervading this body with pure, bright mind so that there is no part of the whole body not pervaded by pure, bright mind. End quote. Of course, a white cloth is a very light image. We're not in the liquid element anymore. We're now in something too light to refer to as liquid. It's the lightness of a pure white cloth. There's a suggestion of brightness there as well. But again, I wouldn't get too literal with that because... Quite often there is some accompanying sense of visual light, but that's in all religious traditions. Light is the light of understanding, the light of freedom, the light of the after-effect of being in the dark, the after-effect of being confused. This light, the brightness of the mind, should be understood as the awakening of understanding or lucidity rather than some literal form of light. Literal light has no meaning. Literal light is all around us, sunny days and so forth. But we're not interested in that kind of light. We're interested in the end of suffering, the opposite of suffering. We're interested in profound emotional brightness and lightness, and so we should always look for that, 
not literalize this into just light. There can be a secondary aspect of light. You know, when you get over some difficult situation, you literally do have a lightening up of the entire environment. It can sparkle. That's a secondary side effect. The main thing is, how do you feel? It's an emotional experience, a very refined emotional experience. And notice that it's not just totally neutral. The body is pervaded by the bright mind. The body does not cease to exist. There is a light neutrality pervaded by the bright mind. So when you're looking just at the Anapanasati Sutta, if you're finding it a bit obscure, you realize it's referring to these jhanas based on the breath. These jhanas can also be approached based on colors or by other elements like water or earth or fire. They can be approached through metta, loving-kindness, or the divine emotions. But here, we're approaching them through the breath. The breath is just a means to that. And if there's any confusion around the very brief instructions in the Anapanasati Sutta, you fill it in not from the commentaries, but from the suttas. This is said to be the actual word of the Buddha. Quite often, reading Dhamma is a dry experience, sometimes pedantic, intellectual, like a puzzle or like an encyclopedia or something like that. The way the Buddha is talking is to say, please get on with it. Just take what you need. You need to get the feel of this. And it's a pretty dramatic feeling. This is a pretty dramatic human experience. This is not just practicing mindfulness so you can pay attention at work or have some sort of clarity. This is dramatic, a very dramatic picture of what's happening to this person sitting alone in the woods. They're in a profound ecstatic experience. And there is an after effect also. You're not just going to get up and it's all gone or walk away like it never happened. It's going to trail you. All kinds of functions of the hindrances are not going to reactivate. The hindrances are rendered unconscious for a good period of time after that. You're able to just go around and talk and deal with things, but it's like you've had an injection of something. Nothing seems to be a problem anymore for a long time. Eventually, the problems come back, and then you go get another dose of jhana if you can. The jhanas have an after effect, just like an argument has an after effect. You get into a big argument and it trails you for days, weeks, months. Just like the jhanas can trail you with a profound experience of peace for days, weeks, or months. 